This short video is about South Korea's worst ever oil spill. We will show in some detail how the action of Samsung's marine spread and the failure of an old short luffing wire directly led to this oil spill. The fully loaded Hebe Spirit anchored on 6 December, about 12 hours before the collision, in a position designated by Dysan VTS. The master anchored his VLCC in sand using nine shackles on the starboard AC-14 high holding power anchor. The marine spread, which consisted of two towing tugs, T5 and T3, Samsung crane barge number one, and a small anchor handling vessel, A1, left Incheon bound for the southern end of the Korean peninsula on 6 December, even though weather forecasts were predicting winds in excess of Beaufort Force 6. This animation shows a tug of about the same size as T5 navigating without a tow in seas that have been affected by wind blowing at Beaufort Force 6. The simulation uses complex algorithms to generate the waves based on the weather inputs. The significant wave height in the simulation is 2.9 meters and the wind has an average speed of 13 meters a second gusting to 18 meters a second. Although relatively small in displacement, the crane barge has enormous dimensions. The jibs tower above Hebe Spirit in this scale drawing. This plot depicts the tracks of the marine spread from 0400 until the collision and also shows the anchored track of Hebe Spirit as well as four nearby anchored vessels. At various times during the four hours before the collision with Hebe Spirit, the movement of the marine spread took it in the direction of the four anchored ships shown on the right of this plot. It is interesting to note that none of these vessels took any action to avoid the oncoming marine spread, bearing in mind the marine spread's erratic movements. Nor did they call Dysan VTS to find out what the marine spread was doing. Most of the data for this plot was supplied by Dysan VTS from their AIS recordings. In the video scenes that follow, we will consider the different areas of the track as illustrated by this overall plot. The software used to create the following clips is a world-leading professional simulation software called PC Rembrandt. For clarity, we have run the program using daylight settings. We will begin by considering the track of the marine spread for 50 minutes from 0400. At 0400 the marine spread was about 3 miles away from Hebe Spirit and would have appeared relatively small, especially at night. Similarly, Hebe Spirit would have been visible to the watch officers on board the four marine spread vessels. In this vicinity all vessels should have been closely monitoring VHF channel 16. This clip begins at 0400, looking from Hebe Spirit towards the marine spread. As the marine spread tracked in a generally southerly direction, it can be seen that on this leg they were shaping to pass clear on the port side of Hebe Spirit, albeit at a very short range. The track of the marine spread shows that they were crabbing, which is a recognised technique used for making progress in adverse environmental conditions. The three-dimensional view is directly driven from the two-dimensional plot and the viewing position is fixed so that the movements of the vessels can easily be observed. According to the captains of the marine spread, shortly after 0445, the tugs altered their heading to the north in an attempt to seek shelter. This alteration of heading resulted in the marine spread tracking directly east. As can be seen in both 2D and 3D views, during this period the marine spread was not heading in any direction that could even be remotely considered as towards Hebe Spirit. The movement of the anchored VLCC that can be observed here is a direct result of the combined environmental forces of wind and current. At around 0530 the marine spread changed direction again 
this time heading directly west, obviously after deciding to continue the voyage. As this direction was generally upwind, the progress made by the marine spread was relatively slow. However, they were still making progress at around 5.50, probably after realising that progress was slow, the tugs changed their heading yet again, this time to the west, and the resulting vector between the tugs and the environmental forces took the marine spread in a general southerly direction, thereby shaping to pass close to the anchored VLCC. Once the chief officer established that the track of the marine spread was heading towards the anchored tanker, he immediately alerted the master, who was on the bridge by about 6.06. .06. The chief officer requested Dyson VTS to advise the intentions of the marine spread. However, they could not give him any immediate information. As a precaution, the master immediately readied the engine and sent the chief officer forward. The engine was ready for use by about 6.14, and the chief officer was ready for anchor operations by about 6.17. At this time, this would have been the view from the bridge wing of Hebe Spirit. By now, the master had established that the CPA of the marine spread was to port, and he therefore, quite rightly, considered that the best course of action would be to pay out more anchor chain. At 6.17, in accordance with the master's instructions, the chief officer began walking out four more shackles on the starboard anchor. The master used the engine dead slow astern as appropriate when the chief officer advised the state of the anchor chain. With the large inertia of the loaded VLCC, it wasn't for another 10 minutes before the bow began moving to port. Shortly after 6.30, Hebe Spirit began settling to the now 13 shackles of anchor chain. From this point until the T5 tow wire broke, the distance was constantly increasing. When the wire parted shortly after 6.51, the marine spread began moving rapidly towards the tanker. No warning broadcast was made by the marine spread and the master of Hebe Spirit was only able to establish through radar distance observation that the marine spread was moving back towards them by about 6.55 or 6.56. This is a camera phone video that was taken by one of the crew members shortly after the collision commenced. As the hooks and spreader demolished the foremast, they also damaged an electrical supply, which caused a short circuit alarm in the engine room. The sparks and the engine room alarm allowed us to establish the time of the first contact. One part of the spreader detached itself during the contact and did further damage to pipelines when it landed on the main deck. This video clearly shows the huge size of the crane barge when compared to the oil tanker. The first contact between the hulls of the barge and the tanker occurred shortly after this video was taken. From this point onwards, the master's main concern was for the lives of his crew and the prevention of fire or explosion. The collision and the massive outpouring of oil became global news. The following clip is from the BBC. Just eight kilometres from South Korea's sensitive western shores, the crude oil spilling into these waters threatens to bring ecological disaster. The oil tanker had been waiting to enter the port of Daesan, 100 kilometres or so southwest of Seoul, when, according to officials from South Korea's Ministry of Maritime Affairs, it was hit by an industrial barge that had broken free from its towing lines. An emergency operation was launched involving more than 40 Coast Guard ships and four helicopters. Some of the remaining oil has been salvaged from the damaged hull. Chemical dispersants are being spread on the surface of the sea and an attempt is being made to use a boom to contain the spill and prevent it reaching the coast. South Korea's western coast provides important yet vulnerable wetland areas for migratory birds. There's also concern that the spill may affect fisheries and oyster farms in the area. In volume of oil, this spill tops what was previously considered South Korea's worst, when 5,000 tonnes of oil washed onto the country's southern coast in 1995. It is hoped that the sea temperatures at this time of year might help minimise the damage by slowing the movement of the slick. But it could reach land within 48 hours, and the specialist clean-up crews will continue working through the night to do all they can to prevent it from doing so. John Sudworth, BBC News, Seoul. 
The oil spill caused widespread pollution on the nearby beaches of South Korea and affected the livelihoods of many of the local Korean people. The master and chief officer of Hebe Spirit, whom many believed acted in an exemplary manner, were charged with criminal negligence by the public prosecutor. In the first trial, both seafarers were found innocent. However, in the appeal court, the judge completely overturned the earlier decision and jailed both officers. His decision was made easier for him by the very dubious findings of the two levels of Korean Maritime Safety Tribunal hearings in which heavy blame was given to the Hebe spirit. Following an industry-wide condemnation and severe criticism of the KMST findings, the Supreme Court granted bail to the Hebe spirit too, as they became known, after they had spent more than a month behind bars. Many observers expected the Supreme Court to apply the law and common sense correctly. In other words, to rise above political expediency and pressure from the public in order to deliver justice. On 23 April 2009, however, disappointment was delivered when the Supreme Court decided that as Hebe Spirit had not technically been destroyed, then the charge of destruction of a vessel, which was the charge that allowed the appeal court judge to jail the two Indian officers, dropped away. Unfortunately, all of the other decisions by the appeal court were left undisturbed, and the two professional officers were left with criminal convictions. This was indeed a poor day for justice that may ultimately prove to be very costly for South Korea and Samsung in particular. The master and chief officer, the Hebe II, returned to India and their families a year and a half after the incident with a bitter taste and a destroyed belief in justice. It is difficult to say whether the convictions that are now on their records may affect their future employment or travel plans. On a lighter note, the Master and Chief Officer recently picked up awards for Newsmaker of the Year from Lloyd's List Asia Awards. Captain Chalwa and Chief Officer Sham were fortunate that the industry rallied behind them due to the clear-cut nature of the case. However, without good evidence, public relations and backing by ship owners, managers and P&I Club, the support may not have materialised and the two officers could well still be in a South Korean jail. Thank you for your attention and support.